You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast coming to you from Montecito, California. And today, before we begin, just reminding you that there's a website associated with this podcast called wealthformula.com. And that website has a lot of interesting things there for you, interesting resources, including various downloads and books and things like that. In addition, it's where you go to sign up for our email list, such as our Investor Club. If you are uh, an accredited investor and are interested in seeing some deal flow, that would be the place to go. Uh, as for today, you know, another another day in paradise, right, in terms of the economy. So this week, and which will be next, will actually be last week by the time this goes out, the Fed, you know, raised rates another 25 basis points, despite, you know, this whole global instability thing and this investor angst, um, and I, I mean, large investor angst. And of course, this wasn't really a surprise. I mean, we kind of, kind of, you know, that was a prediction. They were initially going to do like 50 basis points and they went down to 25 by the way, if you're wondering what a basis point is, because people throw that around, it's just a fancy way of like, you know, 1% is 100 basis points. So do the math, right? Anyway, so how long will the Fed continue to raise rates? That's a question. Well, and I think the answer to that is that inflation, one of two things really, when the inflation has to be clearly under control or there has to be something else that happens that is catastrophic in nature that, you know, is deemed something that they just can't, ignore like a few isolated bank failures remedied by corporate takeovers and stuff like that that just happened obviously they didn't take it very seriously didn't worry about it too much so what is it going to really take to get inflation under control and you know and and that also leading to decrease uh, or a decrease or stabilization in interest rates well I, i hate to say it but i think that the most important part of this whole thing is that inflation really isn't probably going to go down to where it needs to be until we have an increasing level of unemployment. Unemployment's really, really low still, you see. And this particular situation that we're in is strange because the economic pain that we're that we're feeling is because we're sort of in the investor class, right? And and this is a top-down type phenomena, which is affecting institutions and, you know, banks and things like that. First, people are investors, but it's not really affecting retail, you know, everyday people, right? It's just not. Everyday people have not felt the pain because they are not unemployed. And until they lose their job or feel like they potentially could lose their job, they're not going to spend less. And I hate to say it, but I think that's what the Fed's trying to do is drive uh, unemployment up. Um, But until then, expect more of the same. Again, the investor class is going to feel more pain. And as I've said uh, in past episodes, this isn't necessarily all bad because when there's pain, there's blood in the streets. And that's where the opportunities often come to buy. And so that's what we have to look for. You know, in this week's and actually in next week's podcast, too, you're going to hear a similar theme that you should potentially feel somewhat reassured if you, like me, are uh, invest in multifamily real estate. The common theme that you're going to hear from some of these people is that multifamily assets are favorable in down economies and that these assets have become really a, the darling uh, for large investors, big money, institutions alike. And um, so on this week's Wealth Formula podcast. I'm going to interview Harry Dent. And Harry uh, is a really interesting guy. Um, in recent years, he's obviously, if you know Harry, he's been pretty pessimistic, but that's not always the way he's been. He is, um, he's obviously very pessimistic now, but he's had times uh, in you know, like in the 90s where he was very optimistic because he actually follows demographics to help him navigate what's going to happen and project the economy next. And it's a really interesting and fascinating way to look at things and worth uh, definitely worth listening to. So when we come back, Harry Dent. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest on Wealth Formula Podcast is Harry Dent. Harry's uh, been on before. He's a best-selling author and one of the most outspoken financial editors in America. And he is famous for having developed a 
unique method for studying economics around the world and uses analysis to provide insights on what to expect in the future. Um, instead of focusing on endless graphs that assume people behave rationally, Harry looks at real people making real economic decisions for themselves and their family. He also combines demographics, which is a big difference between him and a lot of others, I think, uh, with actual spending uh, to inform his research. So Harry is the author of What to Do When the Bubble Pops, uh, Personal and Business Strategies for the uh, Coming Economic Winter, Zero Hour, and Be Your Own Boss. Harry, uh, welcome back to the program. Yeah, nice to be back, Bob. So, um, yeah, it's it's funny. We... Um, we actually, I think the last time we talked was in in the middle of COVID um, when we had these uh, huge, um, you know, huge government handouts and helicopter money and all that. Um, why don't you give sort of your perspective on uh, what's happened since then? And, um, you know, obviously now we're in the middle of some who knows what right at this moment. But why don't you give us a little bit of a catch up in terms of your thinking? Okay, I mean, first of all, first thing to get, the greatest boom in history, which I alone called back in the 1980s, the yeah. baby boom generation moving into their peak spending at age 46, 1983 to 2007. Everybody thought the U.S. was a has-been. Asia was going to take us over, and yeah. we had the greatest boom in history. Now, the problem is that ended in late 2007, exactly when my 46-year lag for peak spending on the baby boom birth index peak, and we've gone into a slowdown ever since. Mm -hmm. That slowdown actually in demographic spending potential, the most important thing in the economy, among a few others, um, really is bottoming around this year, 2023, okay? So what happened for the first time in history, we had a very sharp downturn in the deepest recession since 1980, 82, uh, in 2008, nine, just as my model would have predicted, the end of the baby boom, if anything, but then the Fed and, and, and government said, well, we can't have this, uh, especially with all the debt and all the leverage yeah. in the economy that they had incurred. And so they've just been printing money ever since. Sure. So, so from early 2009 on, we've been in the printing money economy to try to compensate for a natural slowdown in spending, which will then naturally come back up next year from around late 2024 and 2037 when the millennials have their spending boom. So, so that's my basic premise. Yeah. Uh, demographic cycles, every 40 years typically, boom when a new generation spending and then slow down but governments have been fighting this for 13 14 years and what they did by printing all this money buck is only one way can go they buy financial assets they if they sent us checks in the mail you know in homer simpson especially it would have been more of a consumer inflation thing and a boom and everyday people no the, the rich get richer just continued the money went into financial assets. Yeah. So it drives up bonds, it drives up stocks in particular, real estate uh, uh, across the board, particularly high-end real estate and, 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 and you know, trade up homes and that sort of thing and office buildings. And now that's where we see things cracking. So you have this so, model that obviously, you know, it's, it has been uh, fairly accurate in terms of predicting things based on demographics, but obviously how do you adjust for, a lot of these major, uh, you know, occurrences, like you can't hardly predict COVID and, and, and all of these kinds of things that kind of come in the middle of this. I mean, uh, does that rock you off course at all? Oh, well, okay. You can't, pre you can't predict COVID, but this is where I think the, the central banks and particularly the Fed made a huge mistake. Yeah. Look, COVID was a virus. This happens. It happened in 1918 to 20. You right. know, last a year or two, people get sick. They're going to spend a, less, a little less money. You don't need to have massive stimulus because there's nothing wrong with economy. People just got to get over the virus. Yeah. Okay? But since the Fed and central banks have been stimulating so hard since we really did go into a deep slowdown from 2008 and 9 forward, they panicked and they just yeah. blew the lid off. The, the, the Fed printed $5 trillion, more than they, they had printed in 13 years before, in two years and on top of that, the government added about $5 trillion commitments to fiscal spending. So now we've had this skyrocketing short-term little bubble. 
yeah. that is not going to last because since they lose, you know, since they loosen so much there, they have been forced to tighten because inflation suddenly went from one to two percent to nine percent. And and I've got the best inflation indicator in the world. World, it's workforce growth. Same thing, demographics, and it says inflation should be one to two percent for as far as the eye can see. We're never going to see high inflation again. This nine point one percent was a hundred percent. This overprinting and overstimulus, and now we're in this stymie where oh, well, now the Fed's tightening, and people think, well, look, but the economy's strong; you can handle it. No, the economy's been weak since 2009. Why they've been printing money for 14 years? Yeah, yeah. Why would any? Why would central banks have to print unprecedented amounts of money in greater and greater amounts, especially in COVID? Unless the economy was weak, and it is weak, and it's about to turn strong a year from now. So my view, Buck, and it's very simple, we need to clear out the garbage, the bad debts, the zombie companies, which are all at record levels beyond anything compared to 1929 or 1968 or any other major booms in his. We need to clear out this stuff so the millennials can have their boom. Yeah. And without all this debt overhang and stuff and, and all this stuff, but but nobody wants to do that because, yeah. of course, that would, without question, cause a recession. And in fact, we should have been in more like a depression off and on from 2008 to 23, just like 1930 to 42, back two generations and back, you know, tech cycles, everything I study. So that's where we're at. We, we need to let the economy deleverage yeah. for a year or two so we can have the next boom. The truth is they're not going to do it. Yeah, they're and not going to do happening it. Right now, the right. markets are revolt. The markets are going down just on this little tightening. And now the Fed's got this thing. Well, do we suddenly turn around and loosen, which would look really stupid after they tighten after all this loosening? I think they're I think the Fed made a mistake here. If they'd have kept more modest stimulus, they might have gotten away with this a little longer. By overdoing it, they've had to tighten. They're going to have to at least go a little more tightening, uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and I think that's enough that the economy's weakness will show later this year. And I think we're going to see stocks go a lot lower. And, and this will be good. Stocks will go back to normal. Home prices are the most affordable by far. In all of history, Roaring Twenties didn't see a great housing boom because credit wasn't so easy back then, okay? You had a five-year mortgage and, 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 and 50% down. You know, no speculation back then in housing like today. So this real estate bubble globally is the biggest sign of how big and global this bubble is. The stock bubble, we're having the second tech-driven stock bubble, 2000 and now 2021, we need this bubble to deleverage bad debts and stuff, right. and then we can have the next boom. If not, we're going to be in murky waters. And I think it's going to happen despite the government here because they did finally have to tighten from their own miscalculation. I, I do think they could have kept this going another year or two if they hadn't overreacted to COVID. Nobody would have blamed them for a slowdown over COVID. Yeah, I think the, the thing that I think is uh, interesting to look at right now in lieu of the fact that um, the rates were moved up so quickly. And, um, you know, it, it seems like the the Fed's mantra in general uh, has been in these situations, you move up until something breaks. Yeah. Uh, but something broke, right? And we've, in the, in the sense that we've got these regional banks, um, we've had a couple bank failures and that kind of thing. But inflation numbers come out today, and I think it's still 6%. So now they're kind of, in my view, in a little bit of a pickle, right? Like yeah. you, the optics of, of raising interest rates in the middle of, you know, what looks like a, a, a very unstable economy uh, doesn't seem like, a, doesn't seem like a necessarily the best idea. However, I haven't seen them back off on this. And the major banks mostly are predicting that they're going to go ahead with the 25, at least 25 basis points of increase except for goldman sachs who doesn't think they're going to do it what's your take what's your take on on um you know where we are right now and uh what the fed may or may not do next well the i you know it is between zero and 25 basis more the 50 basis points was on the table before yeah. this happened and now it's not okay but the point to me is what people don't understand, and any addiction expert would understand this, any addiction takes more and more of the artificial stimulus to keep you going. 
And, and, and if you don't, you go into detox and, and, you, and you detox, which is very difficult, okay? So all of this stimulus, it's always taken more and more. And now, just, just for them to not keep stimulating, cause the economy to start detoxing and deaths start failing. Again, here, here you see this bank, there's three banks now under question now. There will be many, many more. There are many companies over leveraged because debt has been so easy and interest rates have been at least two to three hundred basis points lower than they should have been. When, so when money is easy to get and low in interest, people will speculate more and ramp up more debt. And then when things slow down, all that debt and all those bad debts and zombie companies come flushing out. And that's already happening very quickly here. So uh, this is really a duel between the central banks and the real economy. I have studied the real economy most of my adult life. And I'll tell you what the real economy wants. The economy likes to boom and expand all types of new innovations and new generations. Come, and then it likes to set back. It likes to go to sleep and reset things and, and wash out bad debts and stuff. It's, it, the recessions are just as necessary to long-term growth as booms. And the fact that economists don't get that mean they don't understand the economy. No surprise. You ever met an economy looks like they've ever had sex or run a business? <laughs> no, nobody has. Okay. That's the problem. Okay. Yeah. I come out of the business world. Okay. I came out of Harvard business school, went straight into consulting to fortune 100 turning around these companies who had done well in the fifties and sixties, seventies, and were starting to feel foreign competition. And they were like laggards. And then I said, well, this is too boring. And I started consulting to new ventures, the new baby boom oriented new ventures dealing with this new generation. That's when I accidentally discovered, oh my God, <laughs> the baby boom generation is the biggest thing that's ever hit the United States and in the developed world. And we're going to have the greatest boom in history when everybody thinks Asia and Japan's going to take over and they will eventually, but <laughs> it hasn't been the case. U.S. and Europe have had a great boom, U.S. especially. And now we're peaking um, and our millennial generation will, will at least keep us afloat longer than Europe. But the demographics say we need to slow down. And the worst thing you can do is keep carrying bad debts in the future. That's why recessions are necessary. And look, it's like sleeping and awakening. How much do we awake? 16, seven hours, 16 to 17 hours. How much do we sleep? Six to eight. Okay. It's the same with booms, 25, 26 years, and then 12 to 14 year slowdowns, like 68 to 82 and 29 to 42. That's the natural cycle of the economy. And then short term, three, four, five year booms and one to two year recessions. We need this in a, in economists think they're smarter than God, okay? They think they're smarter than free markets after we, the Western world, have proven the power of free markets since the late 1700s, especially the marriage of democracy and, and free market capitalism. Now, what are we doing? We're second-guessing free markets. Yeah. I hope the Fed fails here so badly nobody ever listens to them or lets them run the economy. Their job is not to run the economy and keep it booming as if they would know how to do that anyway. And they don't. They're the ones going to create this bigger crash here when all of this extra debt that we added since 2008, nine has built even higher and we have to wash out even more. So I think we're going to see stocks go down 70 to 90% before this is over in the late mid to late 2024. And when I see that, I'm going to be the most bullish guy on earth like I was in the 80s again, but not until then. So um, the, you know, the demographic uh, way of looking at the economy that you're describing, I think it's, you're, you call it the spending wave theory. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Extremely simple. Yeah. yeah. Explain, explain that a little bit, uh, a little bit again. I know you've sort of talked about it a little bit, but just so listeners kind of have a, a sense of the, you know, the way you approach it. Yeah. One of the good things about the U.S. is the Bureau of Labor has conducts surveys of consumers every year in depth, 600 categories down to hot dogs and potato chips, you know, and housings and starter homes and trade up homes and nursing, you know, I mean, everything. Yeah. So what I found real quickly when I started studying this data for my new venture clients in the early 80s, oh, my God. This, this is the golden grail here, okay? Uh -huh. Because what it showed me is 
the average person, and averages are everything when you're looking at a macro picture, enters the workforce 20, earns and spends more dramatically as they're raising their kids until they get them through school, through high school or college at 46 on average, and then they spend less the rest of their life. And they invest more, and then they retire, and they die. So spending less is deflationary, and dying is the ultimate deflationary act where things disappear. So, so demographics are destiny, and for the first time, I just happen to be looking at demographics for my own clients when the Bureau of Labor started doing these annual (laughs) unbelievable data dumps. They surveyed thousands of households, again, down to, you know, when the potato chips peak, 42. You know why? Average kid born at 28 to their parents and has the highest calorie intake in junk foods at 14. 28 plus 14, 42. So if the economy is that predictable down to potato chips, of course, it's predictable at the macro sure. level even more. That's what I discovered in my own business research. And then that's when I became an economist. By the way, I did not get a PhD in economics. Thank God, because it's useful. <laughs> I started I started with a major in economics. By the third course, I said, I'm learning a lot of in my management, marketing, and accounting courses. I'm not learning crap in my economics courses because it's all theoretical and vague. So, So I became an economist when I discovered this relationship. Oh, it's people, the average person, especially in developed country, are incredibly predictable. Yeah. So you would you would assert um, that spending wave theory, regardless of the short term, you know, changes and whatever panacea that the that the Fed provides, uh, that spending wave theory ultimately prevails in the long term. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, and, and real quickly, I'll show you what it, what it looked like over the last century, okay? Mm-hmm. So so the boom in the 1929 and then the crash into 42. 32 mode, but it didn't turn around until 42. So that was a long-term boom and a bust on the Henry Ford generation. 42 to 68, spending wave of the Bob Hope generation, the World War II generation to follow. They peaked in 68. Ever after that, basically recession, 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 68 to 82 down. So 26 years up. 14 years down, a generational cycle. So the baby boom cycle, largest in history, was late 82 to late 2007. And did the economy peak right on late 2007? As I was telling people what happened in the early to mid 80s, knowing nothing about anything in Uh politics in the future, just because all these baby boomers would predictably spend? Yes. What changed is when they caused the greatest downturn since the 1930s and central banks panic decide, uh oh, we don't trust free market capitalism anymore. We just got to print money and keep this thing going. Stupidest single thing ever to happen in history. And I hope I live long enough to point that damn finger. Yeah. This is stupid to think you can run an economy on, on endless money printing and to think that the economy doesn't need a recession. We've had a recession every decade since I've been born. Yeah. They are necessary, as I said earlier, just as necessary as the booms. They just should last shorter, which they do. Um, talk, let's talk a little bit about what you think specifically of various assets. You've been, um, you know, you, you've been um, on the uh, deflation you know, you've been sending out the warnings about deflation for some time. So are you still in that in that um, mindset? And if you look at, say, gold, real estate, you know, the markets, obviously in the short term, it looks like you've already said that the real estate markets would be in trouble. Or I'm sorry, the um, equity markets would be in trouble. But can you give us some sense of where you think, uh, based on the what's going on and your spending wave theory, what happens next? Okay. First of all, I'll, I'll make a quick comment. Who do I want to favor? The young people here or the old people like me? They're going to die in the next 10, 20 years. Okay. What do young people want? Lower inflation, lower house prices. All this real estate boom and bubble has just benefited aging baby boomers beyond what they deserve. And all this stock bubble, they're the ones that have all the investments. Young people are spenders and borrowers. They're not investors until their 50s on. Okay. So this is also a war between the baby boom, aging baby boom, and the rising millennials around the world and the Jenna, everybody past them, okay? So they're the beneficiaries. Real estate has to come down. The average house, people don't remember that just 20 years ago, and inflation has been low since then. It's 100 grand. Now it's 400,000 something. The same stupid old house in Ohio, okay? This doesn't make sense. How are young people supposed to prosper when they finally get a job and get out of college with all that debt if they went to college? 
how are they supposed to prosper when they have to spend that much money just to get their first house? Uh-huh. Not a trade up home. That'd be 800,000. That first tra- home now 400,000. And yeah, maybe their incomes are 60 when their parents used to be 40, but it doesn't matter. This is an imbalance. Okay. This has all been because of money printing in this bubble and extending this bubble and nobody wanting a bubble to burst. Um, and of course they shouldn't because bubbles always burst violently and twice as fast as they build typical bubble builds in five years and burst in two. Okay. And wipes out all those bubble gains. So, that's where we're at. We had the first bubble in 2000. We had a mini bubble in 2007. And now they've created a totally artificial, the first totally artificial bubble in all of history. Okay. Except for the Mississippi sea bubble way back. Okay. Cause they just pumped up one big company. Okay. But that that's what, that's what's wrong here. Governments took over and said, we don't like free markets anymore because after this great boom in history, we're going to have to have a big slowdown and nobody wants to slow down. Well, I'm sorry, you don't get the booms without the bus. So that's my pet peeve. I, I, I think economists don't understand anything important about the economy, nothing fundamental, because I'm the one that studies people. And I didn't do this. I did this by accident for my own business customers, studying their new baby boom customers. That's how I got onto this. Accidental economist, I call myself. Didn't plan to be an economist, because I mean, who, how many economists can even get a girlfriend? Okay, I hate to say it, but <laughs> it wasn't my goal to be an economist back uh, then. Yeah. But, but when you see it, it is simple. And the, it's the average numbers. Enter the workforce 20. Inflation occurs until you enter the workforce because you cost the economy and don't contribute. 20 to 46, you contribute the most in your lifetime and then you slow down and then you invest the most at an exact number, 63. So enter workforce 20, spend the most 46, now going on 47, and, and invest the most money, have the biggest investment before you retire at 63. And people don't retire on average at 65, by the way, but it's 63 if you do the research. So that's all I do. Look at people. People are predictable in mass, not individually. And people drive our economy. And now governments are trying to play Monday night quarterback and screwing it all up. We could have been had a deeper recession. It would have lasted from 2008 through 2000, mid 2010 like 1929, 30, we could have flushed most of this debt out and zombie companies, and we could be ready to boom again with these millennials. And the truth is we're not gonna be able to boom unless we let the economy do what it needs to do, get rid of record levels of bad debts, zombie zombie companies are record levels, debts at all levels, government to consumer are at record levels and ratios. You have to flush this out. In history, we've always done it, and that's how the next boom happens. Better gem- demographic trends after they slow, and you flush out the inefficiencies and become efficient again. Both those things have to happen to have a healthy boom again. And now all we're going to have is the millennials ready to spend a, a year from now for the next 13, 14 years. Much shorter mil- generation trend in the U.S., by the way, not so much in Asia and all. But and and. And we're going to be hampered by, oh, well, we weren't willing to get rid of all this debt and bad companies. So we're dragging these things behind us, a big weight on the economy. So when you when you look at um, the sort of as a forecast and if you were advising a client or something like that, you you have mentioned now a couple of times that maybe towards the end of 2024, you'd have this uh, period of uh, millennial spending for 13, 14 years. So is do you believe, uh, despite any sort of, um, despite what the Fed's doing, what despite you know economic, um, the forces uh, that are intervening in, in these types of natural um, history of the economy, uh, do, you, do you anticipate that this will be another boom then, um, even despite all the artificial uh debt leverage, all those things that you're talking about? Or do you think it'll be hampered and unable to actually, you know, come to fruition as predicted? It, it'll be both. There's no question that this millennial generation will be enough of a force like the baby boom was. It's just not as long and not as strong, but it, it is still, we have the best millennial generation in the developed world. That's the U.S. Europe doesn't have this, okay? Yeah. Uh, Japan, 
peak before us and doesn't have it. Uh, Korea doesn't have it. China, actually, their demographics are peaking right now and fall for as long as the eye can see. OK, so so we will this this force will be a positive for the economy regardless. It won't be nearly as positive if these millennials and they already hate the baby boomers for this. We already took all their job. We already did all this stuff. We've created all this debt. We've created all these bubbles. They know that. OK, mm-hmm. We were the dominant generation. We got our way, you know, and we changed a lot of things for the good. But we brought we were the only generations that brought central banks that just say, well, the best way to grow is just print money. Mm -hmm. Stupidest idea in history. But that came with baby boomers. Okay, I hate to say it. And baby boom Federal Reserve chairman as they got older. So so you'll have it anyway, but it will be compromised. No question about it. And I'll tell you another thing. Even if we clear out this stuff in the next few years, which I think is going to happen anyway. Okay, I think the economy is going to win here because it's bigger. This boom, the baby boom did happen. I have a 90 year cycle, a super bubble cycle, I call it. It's two technology cycles and the technology cycles are 45 years. I'm telling you like a clock on this one versus the generation at 39 to 40. Okay. So that we're in a super bubble cycle that peaked around two, 2019, 20. Now we've extended of all this stuff. So, so it's not totally unnatural that we have this bubble here and then extends past the demographic cycles because the demographic cycle may be the most important, but it's not the only major cycle. But if we don't clear this stuff out, we're taking bad debts. That's why the economy the, 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 the George Gilder is my favorite economist. And I've spoken with him a lot in recent years on the same stage. His thing, he says, the secret to capitalism is failure. Yeah. We allow failure. Central governments and, and bureaucratic governments around the world, they try to manage their economies and don't allow failure. And that's what our governments, they're not allowing failure. You have to let a thousand lights bloom and then you have to weed out the failures. There's always going to be failures when there's growth in new technologies and new generations and growth. There's going to be failures. The secret of capitalism is we flush it out as we're going. It's not kept in force by a a top-down government. It's a bottoms-up dynamic system. That was the genius of democracy meets free market capitalism, okay? And and we're and we're doing everything against that. We 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 don't understand why we've gotten so affluent in the last 100, 120 years with those with those two factors. And now we're doing everything to fight that just to stave off a short-term damn downturn. Get over it, take your licks, and let's move on. If we don't, it will be come. But yes, we will have more positive fundamental trends even with all this debt. We'll just have to drag it on our backs and it'll slow us down like we're walking uphill with 100 pounds on our back. You know, when you speak about the demographics and how that's drive, driving the economy, I guess the other question for for you is that, you know, obviously you have a, a, a big millennial generation uh, about to spend, but the additional force there that maybe we haven't seen quite as much of is that you've got a lot of baby boomers that are aging um, and so by the 2030s, I mean, you're, you're going to have a significant burden, uh, whether, you know, through Medicare and also yeah. affecting the equity market. So, so again, it, it's, it's hard to imagine the, the economy really flourishing. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you a number on that one too. Okay. Cause yeah. I actually did the calculation on that burden mm-hmm. 2029. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's just several years from now will be the time when that baby boom retirement entitlements burden is at its peak compared to the millennials growth curve and all that stuff. So, so that's, I mean, so yes, that is already a headwind. So if, so in addition to that natural headwind, we've never had a smaller generation follow a larger one. So that is, that is an important headwind. But on top of that, we say, well, and we're not going to clear out our debts from the baby boom generation and this greatest boom in history. And we carry that weight with us. Then yes, we could, we could have the most disappointing, muted generational boom. In fact, we will have the mu- most muted boom in history. And even with clearing out everything, if they do everything I wish would happen in the next few years, and we clear out all this debt and stuff, even with that, their boom will not happen in this bubble 90-year cycle. And so the stocks and real estate, I don't think either of them in the U.S. will see the peaks we've seen recently for the rest of our lifetimes 
and mostly the millennials. That so now we can still have a huge boom if we went down to three to five thousand, you know, on 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 the Nasdaq and then went up to you know, you know, even back to the levels, the peaks we had. Uh, so we can still have a great boom, but but this boom on no level, even in its natural forces, nothing will match what we saw from 1983 to 2007 when the greatest demographic force, and it was globally in, in the developed countries, but it was dominated by the U.S. Uh, we will not see a boom like this again. So if in you're, so, um, you know, and I'm certainly not asking for investment advice or anything like that, but curious what your take is on, you know, the performance of assets where people should look at potentially to deploy capital over the next year or two. Um, you know, I know, for some time, you're um, fairly uh, um, down on gold and uh, you know real estate and that kind of thing. But uh, certainly, we're we are. There's a lot of real estate investors here, and probably curious on your take on real estate in particular. Okay, yeah, yeah, perfect question to sum up here. I mean, mm-hmm. okay, so so stocks definitely go down. And of course, the more leverage, the Nasdaq will go down more than the S and P and the Russell than more than the S and P. Da 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 da. Okay, the S&P is becoming the same thing, but they're all going to go down. I mean, 80% or more, more, okay, if, if this thing really flushes out. Real estate, second real estate bubble looks exactly like the first one, but started at higher levels and went to higher levels. Real estate, this time to go back down to fair value, has to go down 50% instead of 34% last time. That's going to be the biggest hit most people get. So, what do you, and, and stocks go down 70 to 90% like in the early 30s, not normal 40 to 50% major shakeout. So the, the key is there is nowhere to hide here. Investors have to get out of the way. If you have a main home and you're going to stay in it and you have a vacation home, sell the vacation home, okay? Or if the vacation home is where you're looking at retiring, sell the main home now and then move and go ahead and retire in that vacation home, but minimize your real estate exposure, okay? And people ask me, oh, Harry, I got this 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 one, one house with a high debt and the other one with equity. I should sell the one with, with, with high debt. No, sell the one with the equity and get all your money out. The one with the high debt may end up having the bank take a lot of that hit. It thinks that the banks are going to have to restructure debt at some point. And they're the ones that lent too much money. So, so you have to think about it. So get lean in real estate. I mean, as soon as you can, because real estate's hard to move. So you just have to be out of stocks. There is no, oh, defensive sectors might go down 50% instead of 80. I don't care. I don't want to be there. Where do you be? And then this is what's proven, not gold. Gold did the same thing it's doing this time. It, it edged up in the early stages of the last recession, then the early 2008, and then crashed 45, 50% mm-hmm. right into the bottom, okay? Mm-hmm. Gold went down in the end. Gold was not the worst place to be. Did well early on. Gold's done that here. I expect gold to go to 1,000, give or take, before it's over. And then it'll be a great long-term investment because the future is Asia and Asians, particularly Indians, the biggest Asian factor going forward, not China. And India, they love gold. Okay. So gold's going to be three to 5,000 one day, but not because of a crash thing. It is not the safe haven. It wasn't in 2008. So stocks down, gold down, real estate down. Multifamily is the most stable real estate. Okay. Where do people go when they can't afford to buy or when the banks climb up, but then they have to rent and then, and then there's people renting anyway. So it's, it's, so it's multifamily. If I have to own real estate, I want to, I want to own multifamily. I'd rather be out of everything if I could. Okay. Yeah. But, but multifamily will hold up the best and people, more people will be driven to them out of despair. Okay. So you're like, you're like the treasury bond. You're like the safe haven in real estate. Right. Okay. So, so, and, and the ultimate though, and, and this is proven. I have to argue with people like Peter Schiff all the time, and it should not be an argument. 2008 gold crashed in the end and the treasury bonds went straight up in reverse. And and when the things got their worst, mid to late 2008, towards that bottom, the treasury bonds were the safe haven. The longer, the better. 30 year went up 60 percent. 10 year went up 30 to 40 percent. I'm projecting some of these treasury bonds and ETFs like ZROZ, TLT can go up 40, 50, 60, 70 percent in this crisis. Mm -hmm. And here's the bad part. There's no diversification in a downturn. All financial assets bubbled up with easy money and all these policies. 
they will all go down. The only safe haven are the AAA corporates and even more so, and I don't even want to bother with the AAA corporate, the 30-year treasury is the best single thing you can buy. Or again, ZROZ is a 25-year average between 10 and 30. TLT is 20-year average. You know, the ZROZ will go up 50% faster than TLT in a crisis already proven in recent time. So I'm telling people, hey, you could be in cash if you're really confused. Best thing, be in the safest bonds in the world, longest term U.S. treasuries, just for the crash. People say, well, Harry, well, what about down the road? I'm not saying the next boom, you need to be back in stocks and you need, right. need to lean back towards tech in the U.S. and in Southeast Asia and in India, where the growth is going to be, not, not even China so much. So that's the future. But now there's only one thing to do, preserve your money. And the only way to grow it safely in a crisis is these long-term treasury bonds. They are the safe haven. If you don't believe it, look at what they did in 2008. Only thing to go up when even gold went down. And gold was the second best because at least it held up half the way through like it is now. I'm expecting gold to go down to a thousand bucks. Then I would buy it. Yeah. Harry, it's been great talking with you, connecting, uh, and uh, definitely would love to get you back on as we continue this odyssey of uh, the weird economy that we're in. (laughs) Over the hey, real quick, years. Buck. I mean, look, for more information on us, yeah. HS, uh, harrydent.com. Okay, yep. very simple. We have a free newsletter. I and my partner write a weekly article. So keep up with kind of just what we're yep. thinking. And then we have a paid newsletter once people get convinced. Now, I'm telling people, now you'd be better to yeah, do it. Yeah, for paper, sure. But at least yeah. get on our free newsletter at harrydent.com. All you do is put in your name yep. and your email, and you're on our free newsletter. At least you can here i mean because i've already had to change my t- i mean this stimulus thing is so back and forth that, that this is i think stocks are going a lot lower and sooner than later and real estate on a lag but how it happens is, is going to continue to be a bit of a puzzle depending on how these central banks react and now i think they are in trouble because they finally overdid it and now they're forced to tighten or at least be neutral and tightening nor neutral if you've got tightening or neutral, we're going to see this downturn. Again, this story. is uh, harrydent.com. Make sure you sign up for that uh, newsletter. And Harry, it was great to talk to you, and we'll, uh, we'll be in touch, I'm sure, in the, in the coming years. And uh, hopefully you're wrong. <laughs> people should hope that I'm right. Our yeah. long-term, particularly young people, right. Right. our long-term health of our economy, we need this. I am yeah. not a doomsdayer. I've been bullish 90% of my career. And yeah. in fact, I got most criticized in the 80s for being too bullish, That's especially right. on America. Okay? So that I am not bearish, but there is a time to be bearish. And this is it. Yeah. If you can find, if anybody can find bigger or more bubbles than this any time in history, come to me yeah. and I'll hire you. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks again, Harry. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. I guess the moral of the story is, again, you know, we just got to hang on. We're in the right asset class. Um, I mean, if you're an investor like me, you know, multifamily is is where everybody wants to be anyway. So, you know, I think of the pressures that happen that are are bringing the economy down, there's also going to be a lot of money on the side, probably hedging how much things actually go down. But there will be some buying opportunities and, you know, you may want to make sure you join our accredited investor club at wealthformula.com if if that's something you want to potentially participate in. And that's it for me this week on Wealth Formula Podcast. This is Buck Joffrey signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.